Paul, say hi, Dan is dad. Hi. We're happy you're here as well. We're so happy. Um, man, where to begin? Um, last week I was at Oklahoma. I did a youth rally. You know what the thing is, guys? None of them laughed at my jokes. That's why I missed you guys. You guys all laugh at my jokes. <laughs> all the kids, you know, they just, they didn't think I was that funny. They're like, sometimes like my wife, she never laughs sometimes. She just looks at me. She just looks at me. She just gives me that look. It's all right. I, I do bug her a lot, so it's fair. But guys, I'm happy to be back. It was a, it was a long trip. And uh, it just made me miss home. And so I'm really back to be back here in El Paso with my church family here. And guys, um, we have been studying through the Gospels. We've been studying the life of Jesus. And now we've come time for the Beatitudes, which is pretty much Jesus' sermon. This is like the climax, one of the climax. It's, everyone's been seeing Jesus for now a year and a half. They've been watching him do miracles. They've been watching him do some crazy stuff. And now Jesus begins to break down what it means to be a follower of Christ what it looks like, what you do, how you act, what the love of God will transform you into. Amen. And today we're going to go one beatitude at a time. For the next few weeks, we're going to tackle every single beatitude. And there's eight, and then we're going to go continue through Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. We're taking our sweet time. He's excited. I'm excited. We're all excited. So let's get this started. Let's start with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, I am grateful that, Lord, today... Someone has given their life to Christ. And Father, there is no greater sermon than the testimony. And so, Father, I know that there are others here, Father. They may not know it yet, but Father, they're being called as well. Called to the waters. Father, called to deny self and live in the reality of the love of God. And so, Father, as we just continue to break down the word, Father, study and see what it actually means and what it's meaning and testifying for us today. Father, I pray that you bless these lips, mind, and heart, that the words that I say may be acceptable unto thee, and bless the ears that are about to hear this as well. We pray this in the name of Jesus. We all say, Amen. Amen. So last week, guys, well, not last week, two weeks ago, we talked about the kingdom of God. And that was literally on the lips of Jesus at all times. Priscilla, I'm going to bother you for a second. You're going to be in my story. Are you okay with that? All right. You're okay with it? What's your mother's name? Huh? Jessica. Okay. So Priscilla is this little girl, and Priscilla, for some reason, you live in an attic. Why? I don't know. Maybe because you can't afford a full apartment, but you live in an attic, okay? And at night, Priscilla is sometimes, she's tormented by goblins and demons. And every night that she's tormented by goblins and demons, your fairly godmother, Jessica, you show up. And then you protect her, you shine the demons and the goblins away, and they all go away. But every time, Jessica, you leave, the goblins seem to come back and come back. So Priscilla, you come with this great idea, fairy godmother, Jessica, don't leave me. Don't ever go. Like, stay with me. But the thing is, Jessica, you can't always be with her right now for some reason. So you tell your daughter, Priscilla, take this ring, and there's a thread that attaches to a ball, and I'm holding the ball. You hold the ring. And what I want you to do is that when, when the goblins and the demons come, what I want you to do is put the ring underneath your pillow and feel for the thread and follow the thread forward because it will always lead back to me. So Priscilla tries to look for the thread, but she says, Fairy Godmother, I can't see it. But she says, it's so thin that you won't be able to see it, but you'll be able to feel it. And I want you to do is follow me. So the Fairy Godmother leaves, Jessica, you leave, and one day, you know, the goblins and the demons come back. And so immediately, you know what you do, Priscilla? You take the ring and you put it on your pillow and you begin to feel for the thread and you feel it. It's very fine, it's very thin, but you feel it. And you begin to follow it forward, following it wherever it may lead. Because your fairy godmother said before, she said, listen, it may lead to some places of uncertainty, but just know it's leading back to me. So you're following forward and weird enough, it's actually following into the den of the goblin. And so you're thinking to yourself, why in the world am I going to continue to follow this forward? I'm following forward to my death. I'm going to, I'm not going to survive if I keep following what the fair godmother has told me to follow. But you keep following forward because in hopes and belief that, you know, she saved me so many times before, I need to just keep going. So you keep following forward and you follow it forward. And, and what eventually happens is that you get into the den of the goblins and fear takes over you. And for a moment you think, you know what, it might be better if I just stay in my attic. So you know what? I'm going to follow it backwards, but interesting enough, the thread disappears as you try to go back. The only way it leads is forward. And so you got nowhere to go. You're in limbo. You're just like, where do I go? So you know what? 
I'm going to continue to follow further, further. She hasn't failed me before. Maybe she won't fail me this time. So you continue to follow further and further and further. And then it leads you to a wall of just straight up stones, like a dead end. And you sit there thinking to yourself, what in the world am I going to do? There is no way for me to go forward unless I literally tear down these stones. But you got no other option. You're in the den of the gods. You got nowhere to go. If you go back, you're taking over. If you go forward, well, you can't go forward. You got to rock. You got to tear down some walls. So you know what you eventually start doing? You take your hands and you be taking rock after down and down and down and down. And then eventually you begin to hear a voice behind the rock, behind the stones. It's your friend. Give me a friend's name. Anybody. Huh? Kiani? Sounds good. Kiani's behind there. And you, you hear it. And so you begin to tear more rocks down and, and eventually you see her face and Kiani's standing there. She's like, how did you know for me? How did you know I was here? I've been here for weeks. The goblins have trapped me. And he said, I just followed the, the thread leading to my fairy godmother. It led me to you first. You get Kiana out of the wall and, and then you begin to tell her, listen, the way to safety is to follow this thread all the way back to fairy godmother. Because that's the only place where it's leading. And that's where we find hope. And that's what we talked about two weeks ago. Just believing that Jesus is king. See, that's what it means for when we say the kingdom of God is here. When we say that, what we're actually saying is that God reigns. And that he is king of my life. He's king of the earth. He's king of the universe. He's king. And where he is leading, I will follow. Because I trust in him. Because everywhere he's led me so far has never failed me. And yeah, he's led you to the valley of shadow of death. Have, have any of you experienced those in your life? And the interesting thing is that he doesn't lead you around those. Sometimes he leads you right directly into them. But God says, don't worry. I will still be with you in those moments. And what will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding is not the fact that it may feel like you overcome. Because there are times where you feel like you're just being just trampled on it and just being overwhelmed. The thing that will give you peace is the fact that God will be with you. And his rod and his staff will be there to comfort you. That is what it truly means to have peace, knowing that God is right beside me. Therefore, I continue to trust wherever he may lead. Even if he's leading me to places where it feels like he's just taking some things off of me. He's asking me to let go of certain things, asking me to leave behind certain things. I need to just continue to trust because it's actually for my good. Amen. It's, not, it's not leading me to dead ends. It's actually leading me not only for my own safety and my own survival and my own like, blessing, but it's also leading for other people's as well. That's the kingdom of God, and that's what it means to follow Jesus as king. And then Jesus says, listen, you can be a part of the kingdom. You can be my soldiers in the kingdom, and you can usher in the kingdom of heaven by everything you say and that you do, by the way you treat one another. You can be co-heirs of this kingdom with me. I will let you sit on my throne right beside me. And that is the blessing. That is the good news. That is the gospel, because you don't deserve it. Not a single one of us deserve it, and yet God still offers it to you. Amen. Despite what you've done, despite what we've said, despite how we treated one another, God is still willing to allow you to rule with him and be co-heirs of the kingdom of God. And so for like a year and some change, God has been with the disciples so far. And you have to understand, this is way before, way before God even just speaks the Beatitudes which is describing what the people of God will look like. Because, not because of what they're doing, but because they are beholding Christ. And by beholding, we become what? Change. Change. Amen. So, some people have taken the Beatitudes into saying that this is the list of commandments that you need to do in order for you to obtain the kingdom. That's just a bunch of foolishness. Because you cannot do anything on your own accord or through your own strength. It is only through trust and faith in Jesus Christ. If you've heard anything else, you pretty much heard the ugly twin sister of Jesus. The distorted vision, version. Because Christ is saying that I know that you can't do it. I will never ask you to do something you cannot do. But I've done it, so trust in me and rely on my own strength. And I'm going to get you through this. And so we have here that Jesus calls four, four guys for now. We'll just say Peter, James, John, and Andrew. He calls these guys and he says, hey, listen, come and follow me. And the first week that we talked about conquering the beast... We talked about that come and follow him. Pretty much be my disciple. Leave everything you know behind and come and be like me. Study me. 
Sh like, just eat with me, sleep with me, just be with me, and you will become more like me. Jesus is calling the disciples to do so. But as you go to Luke chapter 5, and this, we cannot get into the Beatitudes till we see this story. Go to Luke chapter 5 with me. It's, it's really interesting. The disciples have been with Jesus, scholars have said, for about a year and some change, probably a year and a half, maybe a year and more. They've seen Jesus do crazy miracles. They've seen Jesus do some crazy preaching, better than any preacher on this earth. And what the main sermon that was on Jesus' lips is the kingdom of God. Every sermon that he preached, he was talking about the kingdom of God. That was the main topic, the main thing on his lips. And the disciples have every reason to believe that Jesus is king. They have everything before them. They've seen miracles. They've seen demons expelled. They've heard the voice of God. But yet still there's some doubt lingering. Is Jesus everything he says to be? Because you have to understand that the disciples desperately wanted a king that would be an earthly king like the rest of the foreign countries beside them. A king that would rule, a king that would establish the kingdom through violence, through war, and demolish the Romans. A king that would, would just come and finally exalt Israel to be number one above all the nations. And all the nations will bow down by force. And the disciples were confused because Jesus was doing nothing of the sort. Jesus was actually fighting with the very people that he needed along his side in order for him to establish the kingdom that the disciples desperately wanted. And so the disciples had a lot of doubts in their heart. See, they wouldn't allow Jesus to be who he was. They wouldn't allow Jesus to be what he said he is. They continued to take their preconceived ideas and force it on God. Force it on Jesus. And so there was a lot of doubt in the disciples' minds. Is this truly... The Messiah. Because he's not doing anything that I want him to do. He's doing everything that I don't want him to do. Interesting, huh? And so they kept so much confusion, so much doubt. And that's why you find in Luke chapter 5 that they are, yeah, following Jesus. But you can definitely tell that they're still fishermen. They got one foot in and one foot out. They're still following Jesus and like doing as he says. But yet still they're still calling back to the fact that they are still fishermen. They're going back to their old calling, their old ways of living. They're going back to relying on their own self. And they're in this like lukewarm type of state like the Bible describes in Revelation chapter 3 of the church today, Laodicea. That's who we're called today. One foot in and one foot out. And Jesus has every single right to abandon these lowly, pathetic fishermen. And yeah, you heard me, pathetic because he should just abandon them, to be honest. That's the mentality of the world. They, they, have, they have denied, they have doubted, despite having every fact in front of them that this is the king, that this is Jesus, that this is the son of God. And yet they continue to deny Jesus. They continue to abandon their calling, going back to their old way of living, relying on their preconceived ideas rather than trusting fully in Christ. But Jesus does not abandon them. Jesus continues. You know the crazy thing he does? He continues to pursue after them. That's love. Faithful, long-suffering, patient love. He continues to seek after the disciples, even though he has every right to abandon them. That's powerful in itself. That, that could be the end of the sermon, but we got to keep going. And so Jesus, one day, as the fishermen, they fished all night. I'm talking about all night. I don't know how many of y'all fish. I hate fishing. But how many of y'all fish? God bless you, Elizabeth. Yes, Steve. God bless you. I hate it. I'm so impatient. These brothers stay up all night. All night. Oh, that's an alarm. Yes. Jesus is calling. Someone, whoever the alarm that is. I, I think it's an alarm on this side, but it's okay. But they're fishing all night long. And not a single person on that boat is able to catch a single fish. And I began to realize, could it be, as I was reading scholars and commentaries and studying, could it be the fact that they were not allowed to catch any fish was to help them realize on their own strength they were not able to do anything? Because later on in the story, when Jesus is on the boat, that's when they're able to catch fish. But anyways, different sermon for a different day. And so the fishermen, they get back, Peter, James, John, Andrew, they get back and they're mending their nets after a very long and disappointing night. You read in Luke chapter 5. And Jesus comes to the shore and he continues wanting to preach about the kingdom of what? Of God. The fact that Jesus is king. And so Jesus goes to the disciples and says, hey, 
Can I use your boat? Take me out to the deep water so that I can preach to the multitudes. Because apparently if you preach over water, water can take your voice farther. I have no idea. Tim, if you're watching, you probably know you're in the Coast Guard. God bless you. You'll explain it later for everybody else. Yes. Amen. And so Jesus goes into the boat. He begins to preach. And as he's preaching, I want you to just step into the shoes of Peter. There is so much doubt in this man's mind. He's hearing the words of God. He sees and he's, he's beginning to understand how good this teacher is, master. He has every right to believe, but yet he still doesn't believe. So much doubt in his heart. He has every excuse to just simply fall down and worship him, but he won't let himself do it. And he's watching and he's listening. He's listening from the voice, from the lips of the Son of God. And yet he's still not giving in. And what I love about this is that Jesus still doesn't quit. After preaching the sermon that should have convicted every single person on that boat, it still didn't. So Jesus turns to Peter because he continues to pursue after you, no matter how much you've abandoned him. He turns to Peter and says, hey, Peter, what I want you to do, take your net and cast it into the deep. Pretty much, go try it again. Peter says, brother, <laughs> I've been about this all night. I'm a fisherman. I know what I do, especially during this time of the day. So many people are talking. There's no way we're going to catch fish here. But Jesus, Jesus, you know what? If you said it, I'll give it a shot. I'll try one more time for you, Jesus. So Peter and his friends, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, the disciples later on, they take their nets and they cast it to the deep because Jesus asked them to do so. And as they, as they begin to just... Try to gather the net thinking that it's going to be the same thing that happened last night. Because you know what? Guess what? There's nothing different. It's the same net. It's the same boat. It's the same water. Nothing has changed. But all of a sudden, there's a tug on the net. And you find that there was a multitude of fish. So massive and so much that, that it was impossible for them to actually take the fish onto the boat. That they had to call other boats to come and help them. See, the boat was the same. The net was the same. The guys were the same. The only thing that changed was that Jesus was on the boat. Amen. That's the only thing that changed. And because Jesus was on the boat, that's when they were able to catch fish. And what I love about this story, one commentary said that while the fishermen were fishing for fish, Christ, the ultimate fisherman, was fishing for men. Amen. And that's the miracle. Because as I read this story, I'm not reading it and seeing that the fish are the miracle. The fish are the very thing that like, oh, that blows me away. It's the fact that Peter, James, and John and Andrew were accepted and loved and pursued after. That's the miracle. Amen. Peter, at this moment, the very place, and I love this about Jesus, because Jesus is so specific with each and every one of us. Sometimes we just think that we're just like everybody else, but to Jesus, each and every one of us are so unique. Jesus goes to the very place that Peter feels like he has pride in. He goes to the very place where Peter, it's like his own piece of the earth that he has dominion over. He's a fisherman. He's been doing this all of his life. And Jesus goes to that specific place, that specific ocean that, or sea, and he goes in that specific time where he can show Peter, Peter. I'm God even over this. I'm king. The fish and the seas, they obey me. And they submit to my will. Will you? And so Peter forgets about the fish. He could care less about the other disciples. He can care less about his profession. All his focus is now is on Jesus. And as he looks at Jesus, something crazy happens. You know what begins to happen? Christ's divinity flashes in a moment through his humanity. He begins to see the Son of God, not just the Son of God, not just a human, but he begins to see God because Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Everyone say hi to Devin for me. One, two, three. Hi, hi Devin. Devin. That's what I'm talking about. Devin's in the building. Amen, everybody. Oh, yeah, I'm embarrassing him. He shows up late. Well, for sure we're doing that. I love Devin so much. And so in that moment, as he begins to see God's perfect love, as he begins to notice how Jesus didn't give up on him, he begins to see his long-suffering love, his faithful love, his perfect love. What he also begins to realize is his own sinfulness. Because when I look at perfection, I begin to see my own imperfection. 
And Peter, feelings, just emotions just hit him like a wave. He begins to realize how he has doubted this man, this guy. How he has just, this, this whole year and a half, he's been living in, 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 a, in a state of lukewarm. God, I will serve you, but God, I don't know if I'm really about this. God, I will, I will love you, but God, also at the same time, I don't want to give this up. God, I will do, but God, I won't. He's been living in this very unstable relationship with Jesus. And at this moment, he begins to see all his deficiency, all his sin, all his mistakes. Everything hits him like a wave. And at that moment, he falls to his knees. And what I love about this is that there's an author called Ellen White. Have you heard of her? Really beautiful. I like her a lot. Even if, so our church actually believes she's a prophet. Oh my gosh, I said that? Yeah, our church believes she's a prophet. And some of y'all don't believe she's a prophet. Even if you don't believe she's a prophet, let me tell you something. Her writings are still fire. Like beautiful. Because she says this, that as Peter falls on his knees, he actually still clings to the feet of Jesus. It's like, and notice what he says here. Come with me to Luke chapter 5 really fast. Luke chapter 5. And I want you to look specifically at verse 8. And just imagine with me the fact that Jesus is standing there. Peter is on his knees, but he's still clinging to the feet of Jesus. He says, go away from me with his words because I'm a sinful man, Lord. It's like he's holding on to the feet of Jesus, saying with his actions, please don't go. But with his words, and because he can tell, Jesus, I know you see my past. I know you see my mistakes. I know you see everything. But God, you need to go because I'm not worthy. But God, please don't go. Please, stay with me. But God, you got to go because I'm no good. But please, don't go. I know I'm not worth it, but stay with me. But don't. It's this conflict. And to these people, those who have realized their need of a savior, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. It's not to those who got it all together. It's not to those who read their Bible every single day and pray right. It's actually to those who fail at that every day. Did you know that? To those who have realized that in themselves, they are not qualified. Amen. That they are not worthy. To those who have messed up so bad <laughs> that you shouldn't even be allowed to step foot in this door. Those are the ones Christ says, you are worthy to receive a blessing and receive the kingdom. Amen. At that moment, Peter... He was worthy to be a disciple when he finally realized that his cup was empty, that he had nothing in it. And that was at the moment where Jesus tells him, for he and all the other were amazed, verse 9, at the catch of fish. And so were James, John, Zebedee's sons who were Simon's partner. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, Peter. From now on, now because you know you are poor in spirit, now because you know you don't got anything to give. I'm going to use you. And you're going to not be fishermen of fish, but fishermen of men. It's at the moment that we have realized our need for Christ that qualifies us for the kingdom. It's kind of crazy. The whole time Peter has not heard this sermon of the Beatitudes, yet Jesus still calls him to come and follow him. And some of you have not even realized your own sins yet. Some of you have not even realized the mistakes you have made and how harmful you have treated others and treated God. Because it's not just about God, but we've treated other people very disgustingly. And we have not sensed what we have done to others. We have not sensed the disgusting, just awful things that we have done. And yet despite that, despite not even knowing that God says, still, I will love you and still follow me. Because in time, as you continue to look at my love, it will come to full picture for you. You will be able to see. And so there are some of you guys here today who have not sensed it yet. And to those I want to share with you. And I'm wrapping up because it's 1215 and y'all got to get to lunch. Amen. <laughs> to those I just say continue to journey with Christ. Don't stop. If you have not sensed it. If you have not realized it. Don't stop. That's okay. Christ has come as you are. Christ says I don't care. 
Don't worry, it will come. It will come, don't worry about it. And it's none of our right to make that nobody here should force that upon anybody. All we need to do is continue to encourage people to go into the Father's hands. That's all we're called to do. Because we are all on the same page, amen? We are all poor in spirit, whether we know it or not. We are all called to just simply say, hey, go to the Father. And He will reveal that to you. And in doing so, let me tell you something. You will realize you are poor in spirit. You will realize that you are in Babylon. You will realize these things. And for those of you who have come to realize this, and you have sensed this in your heart, you've realized that your own spiritual righteousness is pathetic, that it's filled with mistakes and wicked things and selfishness, for those of you who have experienced that and understand that, don't be afraid. Because you are now closer to Christ than you've ever been before. Christ is near to you. You are actually closer to the kingdom than you can ever realize. Those of you who have sensed your sins, you are even closer to those who have not even come to understand that they are sinful. And that's why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is yours. So I have a question for you guys, one that I would like you to answer as David's going to come up and play one song. Will you be weak in order for you to be strong? Because God cannot fill a cup that is already full. God can only fill a cup that is empty. That's it. Will you deny self and stop relying on self and your own righteousness and your own pathetic deeds? Man, I'm getting bold today. I don't even care. I can offend you. I don't care. Cool. If the Bible said it, not me. And will you finally rely on Jesus, man? He's good. And he still calls you. And he still loves you. He still wants you. Rely on his righteousness, not your own. Your own is not going to cut it. It won't help you anywhere. It's just simply Jesus and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you if you believe in the Son of God. Amen. He's going to play a song and I'm not going to make an altar call because it's still COVID. But I am going to ask you to sit in your seats, close your eyes, and just seek God. He's there. That is what it means to be blessed. Do you know what it means to be blessed? That you are not forsaken, you are not abandoned, but God sees you and God is near. That is what it means to be blessed. So what I want you to do right now as he's playing his song, meditate on that realization, on that foundation, on that reality that you are blessed and that the kingdom is yours. All you have to do now is step in and believe.
close this out today. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, now this is what the Lord says. The one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you and have called you by your name. You are mine. I will be with you when you pass through the waters, when you, when you pass through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. You will not be scorched when you walk through fire and the flame will not burn you for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom for you because you are precious in my sight and I love you. I will give people in exchange for you and nations instead of your life. Do not fear for I am with you and I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons far from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who bears my name and is created for my glory, I have formed them. Indeed, I have made them. I just want to challenge you and all of us. Stop being lukewarm. Stop, stop relying on your own deeds. But just trust in Jesus Christ. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guide your hearts and your mind. Rely on him. He's all you need. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for Elias' testimony and baptism. And we thank you for the testimony we have that we are still standing here because you still live in us. And you've not forsaken us, but you've even pursued harder after us. Father, we love you and we cannot thank you enough. Father, we do not follow you out of obligation because you are forcing us to. But Father, I will follow you because I have realized I am loved. And that love has awakened a love in my heart that desires to follow you even if it means to my grave. Father, this is my desire. And Father, I pray that this is the desire of our church here on Facebook and here in the congregation. Because God, I just pray that today they have come to realize that though they are poor in spirit, Father, they have everything they need because you are with them and your rod and your staff are there to comfort them. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn this thing off. Bye, everybody. <laughs> and they're up. Oh, nope, you're still there.